We are this morning going to continue our study in the Godhead. I didn't print you one today because it had a, a mistake in it and I didn't want you to get that one. So I've got to fix one. You wouldn't want me passing out error to you, would you? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I uh, tried to avoid those. <sighs> there sure is lots of sparkly new wheels out there in the parking lot today, too. James and Janet, we can have a new car parade out there today. <laughs> we will again uh, continue our consideration of the Godhead. We started last week to consider the third person of the Trinity. Emphasis on person, not an it. <laughs> you even caught me last, or week before last, I, caught, I said it once. It's... it's I don't know why we still do that. Let's, by way of reminder of what we talked about two weeks ago, why is talking about the Holy Spirit for many people harder than talking about the Father or the Son? Why do we refer to one as an it? Yes, sir. Well, you know, you said you made a mistake. A lot of times, you know, we, you know, it's the Holy Spirit. Yep. <laughs> and that is the word that confuses everybody. Yeah, it is. We have God, we have the Son, but then we have the Spirit, which is something we don't understand, that word. And again, that was much the reason behind beginning this study of the Godhead. You know, people talk about Father, Son, and it. <laughs> yes, Tony. I just have a question. Um, I've heard Holy Ghost. Is there any such thing as that, or is it the same word? Uh, just the King James translation of it. Okay. Uh, They want to know what he looks like? Yes. Why is it easier to talk about the Father and the Son? Because we have a figurative description of what God looks like. He's described in anthropomorphic terms with, a, with eyes and ears and a, a nose and a mouth and arms and hands. Figuratively, that's what God, that's how we understand God. Literally, then, for a certain number of years, Jesus literally had f human features. We have a concept of what they look like. What's the spirit look like? Is he a ghost? Yes, Jeff? Well, it says they're made in his image. Is that including all three? Absolutely. Was the Holy Spirit involved in our creation? Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, that's, that's one of the, the reasons that, you know, the Bible speaks of the Spirit more in atmospheric terms, like wind and, and vapor and, and fire. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, one of the problems with the Holy Spirit is, is the problem, a product of the age in which we live. In certain time periods, the emphasis was all on God the Father. Sometime the 19th century during the Restoration Movement, the emphasis was on Christ the Son. And after the early, the beginning of the Pentecostal Movement in the early 20th century, the church largely rejected the extremes of Pentecostalism and their reliance on the Spirit. And, and to some extent, we got to where we didn't talk about it at all. You know, don't want to be like that. And so that's a problem. There is really a lack of understanding, either literally or figuratively, uh, whether the spirit literally or figuratively indwells a person. On the other hand, you might also ask, well, does Satan literally or figuratively indwell a person? That's something we, we want to, you know, the problem is we always want to know precisely how everything works, don't we? Even of the Godhead, we want to know. 
This is what Father's doing, this is what Son's doing, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. We want to have it all kind of compartmentalized, have it all nailed down, but it just doesn't work that way, does it? The Holy Spirit, the Trinity, how many attempts have you heard of people trying to explain it in physical terms? What are some of the attempts? I've heard it compared to being an atom, like the nucleus of the atom and the other elements within the atom. Is that how it works? I've heard it explained as being like an egg. I don't remember how exactly that works with the yolk and the white and the shell and all that stuff. The problem is you cannot explain in physical terms the, the nature of deity. You just can't. There's some things we just can't understand. But we still want to neatly subdivide it all. And so in the result of that is, again, I'm just reviewing from a couple of weeks ago. The result of that is what's called dispensationalism. In the Old Testament, it's thought that only God was working, the Father. During the 30 odd years that Jesus was on earth, then Jesus was working. After he ascended, some would say that only the Holy Spirit is working. What's the truth of the matter? All three are working together at all times. And so, uh huh? And you know, um, when Jesus came and died, and we were left with the Holy Spirit, we need all three of those to be here and to survive. We have to have all three. Yes. So we have to have the Holy Paul declares the fact of what you're talking about in a, in a prayer in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. And there's so many passages we could go to for this, but 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. Praying for the saints in Corinth, he says, that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the God, referring to the Father there, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, all three of them. He's praying to all three in one. So there they are. All three are actively, in the words that Paul uses there, actively involved in grace and in love and in the fellowship, all at the same time. Still, we tend to refer to the Holy Spirit, He, the Spirit, as the third person. Why? Like He's, and there is a, a traditionally uh, a line of thought, well, fa the Father's the main one and the others are just kind of pulling the load with him. It, it's not always in, in that order. When you get to Romans 15 and verse 30, the order there is Son, Spirit, and Father. And at the moment, it, so it, it is the interrelational working of all three. Then one more touch of reminder, we, the other problem with talking about the Holy Spirit is people's subjective emotional experiences. I'm not denying emotional experience or that there should be some feeling in our trusting God, but when it's impressions apart from the knowledge of God, If it, it's a feeling apart from the knowledge of God, can you trust it? No. No. That's not valid proof of one standing with God. You know, people have, a great many people have those kind of, that kind of sense that they're, they're by a perceived revelation or a perceived feeling apart from the knowledge of God, they see that as a proof of their being right with God. Can you trust that? No. No, it's... You mentioned when the Spirit, Jesus ascended, and when the Spirit came to be our helper. How could the Spirit help? In what way is the Spirit helping? Reminding us of the things that Jesus taught and the words that he received from God. So this, the... When people are talking about what they feel or what they know, but it's not associated with anything God has said, that's not a valid proof that they're standing with God, is it? 
And so you have to be careful of that. I bring that up because, maybe because growing up in the denominational world and being somewhat familiar with that, you still hear today preachers talking about God's doing some new thing. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 42 and 43 and verse 40, in chapter 48, three times, it's talking about God's doing a new thing. What's he talking about in Isaiah 48? Talking about the coming of Christ. God is, it's, it's not a new thing in an eternal sense. That was determined before the world was made. But still today, people will say, well, God's doing a new thing. I remember a discussion I had with a man that, you know, really had this sense that, that God was speaking to him uniquely. I just had to ask, well, is he, is he going to say something to you he hasn't said in his word? Fortunately, I got him to agree on that. No, he's not. He's only going to affirm what God has said. Well, what is the Holy Spirit doing? We're just talking in general terms today. Before we get hard into specifics, what's the Holy Spirit doing? What? Is the Holy Spirit involved in the work of conversion even before we're saved? Yeah, sure is. First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. Verses 6 through 8. First John chapter 5 reads a lot like the, the revelation. It's talking about those who overcome in Christ. First John chapter 5, we'll start in verse 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. What's the Spirit agreeing? What is the agreement? That those who are in Christ are overcomers. The Spirit is testifying about that, affirming that, that truth. And so the, the Spirit is, well, let me ask this question. Is the Spirit involved in the sanctification process? And we're calling it a process, not a step. When does sanctification actually begin? The process of it. Before that, when you heard the gospel and when you gave yourself to be willing to hear it and to move towards believing it, was the Spirit involved in that? You know, we often talk about it like five real clear steps. Hear, believe, repent, confess. But it is this, this moving. When... When I was involved in another, de not another, when I was involved in a denomination, and, and coming to understand my need, my, the truth about the church, the Spirit was beginning to sanctify me, was beginning to set me apart from that Baptist doctrine, set me apart from that further and further, until I would come to re receive the truth in the way to, as to obey it, wouldn't it? It continues to set us farther and far when you are baptized, sets you far away from your past. Are you further away from your past now than you were five years ago? Yeah, yeah a lot further away from your past. Are you going to be further away tomorrow from the past? Yeah. That's sanctification, that continuing process. The Spirit's involved in that. Still working in that. Yes, Jeff? We don't receive the Spirit, though, until baptism, correct? Right. The, the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. The, 
That assurance, what is the gift of the Holy Spirit? That assurance that God has done precisely as he has said by your trusting the word and being obedient to it, God is, in that gift, is, is affirming that he has washed you, from, uh, cleansed you of your sin. When you're sealed in it, right. according to Ephesians. But the Spirit is working. Always working. Always working, yeah. Um, you know, then on the other hand, you get the line of thought that people have to be baptized twice. In a sense, first in water for the forgiveness of your sins, but they would say, well, you're not really a Christian until you've been overwhelmed by a... A visible manifestation of the Spirit taking control over your life and your actions, and even the way you speak. No, it's all at the same time. Yeah. I have a question then. So, if what Jeff said is right, then what is the difference between the Spirit working in our lives before we are baptized and we turn our lives over to God, and what is the difference between the gift of the Holy Spirit? So, if we're already being led by the Spirit, what is the difference? I mean, as far as the Spirit's job or whatever. One is being influenced, moved towards it. In, in the gift, you have the assurance of having received it. Or uh, salvation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, all things of God are working that way, aren't they? Be it the Father or the Word or Jesus himself. What's he doing in his earthly ministry? Keep pulling people towards that kingdom is to come. They're not in it yet. But he, he's leading them, pulling them, and you know, all that. Working, working, working. But when is he their savior? When they're baptized. That's when it's converted. Did you have something, Glenn? Well, you mentioned the and being sealed. Uh-huh. Yep. Go ahead and read it for us. Verse 13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and in whom also, after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, the redemption, the purchased possession, and the praise of glory. You got past, present, and future tense there. You trust, you believe, you trusted, you obeyed, you were sealed, present tense, with this promise for what? Future tense? Yeah. That's all the work of the Spirit. But it's, the relationship changes, it becomes, the promise is yours when you at last obey the gospel. Can I ask one thing to that? Sure. So, you know, in my walk, there have been times that absolutely when I wasn't doing right, that I could see the work of the Spirit working and just save it. And so now, I think more once I was baptized and decided to really follow God the way you should, is you have that peace all the time also. You know, because now I have a peace no matter what. I'm going to have still see the spirit working all the time because there's too many things that was could have been coincidence, you know, had been some I think for many of us is true for me, we often see the spirits working in hindsight. Yeah. You know, why did thirty plus years ago we wind up in Idaho? In hindsight I can see providential ways that it was all God working together and the blessing in that. But it is still working in that whole process of sanctification. It is working providentially. You know, 
with with God in in these providentially in this way that although we talk about Jesus being the mediator the spirit is also a mediator isn't he spirit is interceding on our behalf our taking our request and conveying even then conveying the answer to man and so this the spirit while we think about it is is being think about it I did it again <laughs> while we think about him as, as something aside and apart he's, he's actively working all three did you have something to him? well it's just, you know we look at the three you know man has a natural desire to worship something greater mm -hmm. uh, in, his, in our case God then he has a son who came physically we all have a spirit in us and now the spirit after the physical thing happened the spirit is working with our spirit to bring us around to what we need to be and continue to be what we need to be I like the way you said that working with our spirit it is so much a cooperative thing. You know, some people say, okay, I believe God, you just do it. You just do it. And I don't have to do anything. It is very much a cooperative thing to be willing to die to the old spirit. Let him control a new spirit that he has put in us. And then cooperate as he brings us along. That's part of that same process that Glenn was reading about in Ephesians 1, verse 13. Once you've trusted and believed, there's that new spirit. And cooperating with God, then all that he has promised is assured. Talking about the spirit, we're going to consider, again, as we did the other persons of the Godhead, the, the different titles for the Holy Spirit. And he's called the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, some places he's called the good spirit. It, look at that. Psalm 143, Psalm 143, verse 10. The good spirit. Reminds me of the song, The Lord has promised good to me. Uh, 143, verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Lead me on level ground. Lead. Let your good spirit, uh, another translation, sometimes the King James Version, uh, says, uphold me with your free spirit. Same thing. It's, it's a prayer to the Lord. D give me all... Of, of that working in me to, to lead me give it freely all that I need to, to lead me where I need to go it's a good spirit the spirit of wisdom also called the spirit of understanding the spirit of counsel or, or, or might spirit of grace and supplication many many titles but some of those titles re re represent the Spirit's relationship with the Father. Some represent his relationship to the Son. There's titles that represent his own eminent character and his deity. We see those as well where he's set apart from the other two. And again, in Ephesians 2, in verse 18, you know, there's the one Spirit, the one body, and all that one declaring the eternal Spirit. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, it talks about there the eternal spirit. Why would he mention the eternal spirit to the, in a letter to the Hebrews? What's the problem with their faith? They're not quite sure the sacrifice is Christ is sufficient, is, is it? So why remind them of the eternal spirit? It's that helper reminding him of those things. Paul, you said Hebrews 1. 9 and verse 14. 
For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. That's speaking of Christ. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. Where is, uh, who is that? It's, I started one verse too late. <laughs> Verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God? How much did Christ depend upon the Holy Spirit? Did he give himself to the cross in that sense alone? No, he, the Father was, he was doing the Father's will. And the only way he could do that is with this Holy Spirit working with him. There, there are titles which especially express the Holy Spirit's relationship with, with Christians. And that uh, would mean the way that Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Look at the Gospel of John. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 17. There's three fairly close references there which Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit. Uh, starting in John 14, verse 16. Of course, the disciples are quite upset what's about to happen, finding it very hard to, to believe all that Jesus is saying and to continue to trust. And so in verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. And that is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. You know, it's that thing we were talking about earlier. The spirit is influencing all along. But who, who knows this? Who can have this helper? You know him. That's when you have that, that benefit, that strength, that assurance that he is with you and in you. John chapter 15 and verse 26, in much the same way. Chapter 15 and verse 26. And when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who intercedes, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You know, still it's hard to say, how do these three separate ones all work together? But there's a verse that tells you all three of them are, aren't they? Verse 26. One coming from the Father. Actually, two came from the Father. One is returned back to the Father. And the other is yet helping. The Spirit of Truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. Interesting, again, we talked earlier about how this sanctification, sanctification process works and what we can understand today that we couldn't understand yesterday and hopefully we'll be closer to understanding tomorrow. Chapter 16, verse 13, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of mine, and will disclose it to you. What's the relationship between God and the Spirit, or the Father and the Spirit, and the Father and Jesus? The exact same thing. Did Jesus ever disclose anything that didn't come from God? No. Does the Spirit ever disclose anything that doesn't come from Jesus and God? And so they are indeed working together in ways that we might not yet understand. But it will, even as is said there, it will ultimately be disclosed to us how that all works together. Let's talk briefly about how we read of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. There's only one scripture that speaks of all three, and it does so right from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 and verse 2. 
What was the Spirit doing in the creation? Genesis 1 and verse 2. No, we have a pretty good understanding. I, you know, God spoke and Jesus created, but what was the Spirit doing? This thing's coming apart here. Verse 1, in the beginning, God, that's all three working together, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. What's the Spirit doing? Moving. What's it? You know, things, start, things are formless, but they're starting to take shape in a sense. What's the Spirit doing? Pulling, I don't, I can't picture it, or I can't describe it, but, but pulling, thing, pulling this around. Out of nothing, all, there's, there's these elements being spoken in existence, and there the Spirit is already working in this to, to put it in order. And so the Spirit is there even in the work of creation. But certainly it's the collective will of, of all three. By, by the breath, you know, again, he's not often described with physical features, but by the breath, Job 26 and verse 13 says, the heavens are cleared. Look at Job 26 and verse 13. Uh, it is part of that counsel that Job receives from some of his friends, the friends who in many ways do not understand how God works. But in, in this, he seems to get it right. Job 26 and verse 13. By his breath the heavens are cleared. His hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. He's talking about all the ways that God... Is, is working. Job here is rebuking Bildad. Bildad's one of those friends that says God only works in one way. What was their understanding of God's working? They only had one picture of God. You sin, you die. You sin, God's mad, he kills you. That was it. That's their basis of their argument. Is Job says, no, not quite that way. By this, the spirits, the, the heaven are cleared. It, it's figurative language. In a sense, when smoke gets in your eyes and you can't see, you can't understand, it clears up all that confusion. Isn't that what we need sometime, even today? The influence and the, the spirit's influence and, and wisdom and understanding to, to clear up all that confusion. Reminds me of Solomon talking so much about the, the, the work of the Spirit. What's the Spirit doing? Remember he describes her as being on every street corner, calling out to everyone. Come seek me. Come seek me. First you'll get knowledge, then you'll get understanding, then you'll get wisdom. It's all this influence, the leading of the Holy Spirit to clear the smoke that's in the skies. Clear out the heavens. Yes, Jan. Yeah. Yep. Um, Knowledge, understanding, wisdom. You said a, a crucially important word there related to the process, the humbling process. You get knowledge by confessing you don't know it. <laughs> you don't have it, that you need it. You get understanding that, well, okay, I know what it says, I just don't know how to live it. 
and take yourself down a notch. You finally receive wisdom to apply it. What do you have to do? I've got to let my way of doing this go. What I have done, what I would try to do on my own just isn't going to work. That humility. Let the Spirit figuratively clear the smoke out of the heavens. Let the Spirit give you understanding. Again, the, the, the Spirit, the concept is that God speaks and Jesus creates and the Spirit is doing the finishing work. And that's a, a work of the Spirit still in, in progress. Even as God, uh, Paul talks about in Philippians 1 and verse 6 that God who began a good work on, in you is continuing to work in that until completion. Well, the Spirit's involved in that. And so that's just a, a rough beginning of our study of the Spirit. We'll get into it uh, a little more deeply next week. hope it's a blessing to you to consider.